Welcome to Chautauqua Lake from 1945 to present. I do not have a map of Chautauqua Lake in 1945, but I do have one that has a base information starting in 1954. This is a seven and a half minute quadrangle map, and it shows you Chautauqua Lake and its watershed. By 1954, we have a substantial portion of the shoreline of the lake uh, under development. Such things are still missing, however, as Sealand Drive going from the Wayland Street and around to the Big Inlet. We've got tremendous amount of development up the Big Inlet. We've got partial development into the, what is, was the swamp on the 1904 map. And as we come down the shore, we have place after place with development. Chautauqua Institution, of course, is spread out. We now have the uh, development Chautauqua Shores, the development uh, in the vicinity of the Pendergast Fish Hatchery, and on down and around the lake. And even in the Tom's Point, which is shown on the map as a wetlands, uh, we have development taking place. And all the way down, you can see a thin line of about one lot depth development down the shores of the lake till you get to Viewcoat which was shown on the 1904 map as a swamp, is now an intensely developed area. And we can go up the other side of the lake in the same manner. Uh, in 1992, uh, I did an estimation of the shoreline that was undeveloped uh, on Chautauqua Lake, and we flipped the numbers from 1904, or the turn of the century, where there was seven miles of developed shoreline, we now have seven miles of undeveloped shoreline. The biggest property owners on the, around the shores of the lake, the biggest property owner on the shores of Chautauqua Lake, is the state of New York with the Long Point State Park and the fish hatchery and the recent purchase of the rest of Tom's Point and the wetland that is there. Uh, purchased uh, because they felt that this was a very important muscular spawning area on the lake. And we'll get into that uh, in more detail uh, at a later time. We also have behind me some aerial photography that was taken in May, April and May of this year. And it will help uh, you to understand the development pattern again. Here's the village of Mayville. Here's the New York State Department of Transportation and the Chautauqua malted plant with its ponds. And this has a very interesting history that we may spend some time on because this little inlet at one point is 28% of the phosphorus loading of Chautauqua Lake. The other photograph that we have here is the Chautauqua Bemis area, Long Point State Park, part of a terminal. This whole area is part of a terminal moraine system. Got beautiful, beautiful sands uh, in Tom's Point, along the edges of the State Park, Be Bemis Point, and of course, uh, Oriental Park. The Oriental Park has been growing since the turn of the century. Uh, no public water supply to date. However, we do have a sewer system there now. Down to the other end of the lake, uh, High Acres Mobile Home Park, the Ellicott Ellery Town Line, the junkyard that is right across from the Flavana Elementary School, which is now uh, a resource center facility. And if you look back far enough uh, into Benita, you see, again, uh, mostly linear development until you get to Point Stockholm and Sheldon Hall and Dutch Hollow Creek. This is the most active growing delta on the lake uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the development basically that has taken place through this period of time is one lot deep. I like to refer to it as the first 250 feet of, of the shoreline of the lake. Realize that up until 1965, the only regulations that were enforced dealing with Chautauqua Lake were those that were enforced by the local health officer. And they were not necessarily well enforced. The fact of the matter is that 
Dr. Gunkler of WCA Hospital in, in Jamestown headed a committee shortly after I came to Chautauqua County uh, to talk about the pollution of Chautauqua Lake. And uh, it was absolutely amazing the places that we went to. I can remember going to Point Stockholm and opening a manhole cover and looking to where the outfall went and it went right straight out into the lake, right from the manhole. I can remember going to a canal in Oriental Park uh, that absolutely reeked. That's the only, that's a nice description of it. The uh, activity and pressure for development of the lake continues to expand, uh, but until the health department comes along in 1965, there is no regulation as to how a person is to install a sewer system around the shores of the lake. I'm going to sit myself down here for a few minutes so I can get closer to this outline. It's easier to read that way. Uh, we have people beginning to be concerned about the elevation of the lake in the summertime. The Lake Association writes a paper. Uh, nothing is done about it, uh, but there is a pleading. We have um, this Chautauqua Lake Association now is in the forefront as the keeper of the lake, along with the state of New York. They're playing games with the aquatic vegetation of the lake. And uh, the state starts out by using uh, arsenic compounds to control the weeds. And then we get into sophisticated chemicals such as Diquat and 2,4-D. And the lake rooted aquatic vegetation is bothering us. Uh, we're, we're in conflict with it. Uh, we're having an algae blooms, and we're not happy with it. We also have an uh, incident of flooding again. And the Corps of Engineers, uh, the politics of this, I believe, is that Dan Reed was the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, and he had no great project in his district, and the Corps of Engineers was going to give him one. And so they come up with a 1995 report um, in the 84th Congress uh, on a proposal to eliminate the flooding on Chautauqua Lake. Now, believe it or not, it includes everything that was in the 1944 report. It says, open the Shattercoin River from the boat landing uh, to the dam so that we can control the flow out of the lake better. It says, uh, don't build in the floodplain of the lake. It says, have a lake regulation scheme. And then the Corps of Engineers does an interesting thing. And it's mentioned back in the hydrological section. They do a a write-up of the maximum possible storm that could hit Chautauqua Lake and what would happen to the waters of the lake. And we're talking about 23 inches of rain in a 36-hour uh, period with the lake re rising up to an elevation of 1319. Now that's 11 feet above the normal summer elevation. That's the maximum storm, okay? Uh, a frightening contemplation uh, absolutely. Uh, and I'll tell you why later in, in some of the work that we do uh, on the lake during these years. Uh, they also then say, uh, because of this and because of the standard project storm, we need, in order to guarantee uh, safety in the, the flooding areas of the lake, we need to build a channel out of the lake in the vicinity of the Little Inlet up through the Continental Divide to empty into um, Little Chautauqua Creek. And of course, today you wouldn't even contemplate that because of the environmental questions that would be raised. But at, the, at that point, there was no environmental constraint uh, of that type. Uh, there was a lot of emotion spent on that project. Uh, a lot of people were for it. A lot of people questioned whether or not the cost-benefit analysis had been done correctly. Let me give you an example. If there was a storm on, and a, a lake crest on March 15th at, we'll say, 1312, and then it dropped down to 1310.4 and rose again to 1312 a week later, my oriental rug and radio that was lying on the floor of my cottage was counted both times in the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, 
I testified at a hearing where I was finally gaveled down that if we took out those types of duplication, instead of there being a positive cost-benefit analysis, for every dollar we spent, we were only going to get 88 cents worth of benefit, which meant that the project should not go forward. Uh, 1955, we get into the scramble of that. We also get involved with the, uh, into the Gunkler Committee. Uh, sometime in the early 60s, somebody reintroduces the Walleye Pike uh, to Chautauqua Lake. Uh, there are a number of stories about that. I don't know which of them are true. I have advanced one of them because I know some people that brought five-gallon pails of walleye fry up from Lake Erie and put them in the lake. Uh, but whether or not that is a, an absolute truth is uh, open to the mythology of Chautauqua Lake, and we'll, we'll leave it right there. Uh, during this period of time, uh, in the mid-60s, all of a sudden we get a group that say, hey, we ought to look at a public law 566 watershed program for Chautauqua Lake. It would be much more beneficial. It would help us hold our summer lake elevations. Um, it would help us uh, regulate the lake better. We could take the, cr the crest off the flooding. Uh, we could lower the siltation rates in the lake. Uh, we could have a better summer on the lake. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis was looked at. Uh, the agriculture department said that there was not enough siltation taking place in the general watershed of the lake uh, to put in uh, uh, retention ponds for sedimentation purposes. And uh, then they, somebody made the mistake of saying, and the, the greatest contributor to siltation of Chautauqua Lake are the dairy farmers of the watershed that are still allowing their, their cows to walk in the streams and churn up the, the bottom of the streams. And of course, immediately the stream tries to, to level that out. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the fervor s started to, to melt uh, in the community. We, of course, are deeply involved in a chemical war on the lake. Uh, the next thing that is of excitement that comes along uh, we now have regulation of development around the shores of the lake. All of the towns and villages on Chautauqua Lake now have building code regulations, minimum lot sizes. The health department is enforcing uh, sewage disposal. I would suggest to you that when the first studies were done by Dr. Erlinson and others in the 60s, when they pin pinpointed that's not the right word. When they documented the great amount of uh, sewage that was going into the lake from individual systems, uh, they've all, the vast majority of them have been corrected. We no longer put sewage directly into the lake in, in any amount or quantity. Federal flood insurance comes along in 1969 which says, thou shalt not build in the normal floodplain or the 100-year floodplain. Says you will not build in the floodplain. And then it makes recommendations related to the 100-year floodplain. And finally, uh, the, all of the local governments take that into their uh, regulation ordinance system uh, because if they don't, the people of their community don't qualify for federal flood insurance. Uh, our next benchmark that we look at is Tropical Storm Agnes in June of 1972. <clears throat> a very interesting fickle storm that came up and straddled parts of New York State and gave us an inordinately high amount of rain, uh, gave us some flooding, uh, but not the worst in, in recent memory. And from that program, we receive enough funds to do a study as to whether or not the gauge on Chautauqua Lake at its location at that time was in the right place, <clears throat> and whether or not we ought to have a new gauging station. We end up with a gauge run at the north end of the lake, at the center of the lake, and the south of the lake for a year. And when that report comes in, we conclude that we ought to build a gauging station at Bemis Point, and, and maybe we'll go out and look at that gauging station uh, in a field trip. So we now have a gauging station at Bemis Point, 
There is a gauging station at the outlet of the lake uh, down at Dow Street in the city of Jamestown. And uh, we've had this terrible storm. And we have flood plain maps created around the shores of the lake and in any place where the 13 10-foot contour line is more than 50 feet back from the shore, we have mapped it. That information is available in the county planning department. 1970 to 1975, we have an organization that's created to study the Allegheny River Basin and its water resources. <clears throat> and from that committee, which was chaired by uh, Merle Smedberg, who was then the director of the City of Jamestown Board of Public Utilities, comes a regulation scheme for Chautauqua Lake, something that was recommended in 1955 and something that was recommended in 1944. And they come up with a regulation scheme. Every morning, the person that operates Warner Dam looks at the lake elevation and what the weather forecast is going to be, and he decides whether or not to do something to Warner Dam. Now realize that Warner Dam has a capacity of 6,000 cubic feet per second. However, you can only put 1,220 cu or, I'm sorry, 1,720 cubic feet per second down the river, uh, and they start stressing the people in the village of Faulkner. Uh, so this, this scheme is put together to try and take the lake down as far as we possibly can in the winter, as low as we can possibly get it. The only problem with that is that the lower the lake gets, the more the flow is limited because it is the elevation of the lake that dictates the flow between the boat landing and Warner Dam. It's not Warner Dam. Warner Dam only controls at the Warner Dam point and we have the constriction above the Third Street Bridge. We, we can't do anything about it. If you remember, we were supposed to have that dredged out. We put the regulation scheme into to existence, and it begins to operate. And if you were to look at the chart up on the wall, or on the easel over here, uh, at the uh, recent years of it, you will find that we have uh, very little in the way of uh, flooding taking place after the 1976 uh, implementation. How, uh, but we do have the 76 storm, which is uh, quite high. It exceeds the 100-year storm on the lake. And um, the reason for that is a spring freshet, and we'll talk about that for just a moment, because that's, that's the year that uh, I did an intensive study of the snowpack in the watershed of Chautauqua Lake and went to the then uh, chairman of the, uh, I'm sorry, the county executive and to our uh, emergency preparedness people, Wanda Gustafson, and said, we're going to have a flood. And the question is, how shall we share it? Do we share it by keeping it up on the lake or do we put it down the river? And what happened was that the flood of March of 1976 put water around 845 homes in uh, the, mostly the lower reaches of the lake. Uh, the Corps of Engineers insisted that there was one basement flooded, but I, don't, I, I couldn't find that when I sent a, a field team out to investigate it. The uh, flood takes place. Uh, it enforces people's thinking about using federal flood insurance. Uh, it uh, becomes uh, important to uh, implement the building codes even more aggressively than we have in the past. The next important thing that happens, a, a whole series of things tumbled through the 70s and the 80s. 1975, the Chautauqua County Sewer Agency is created. Uh, county government could not be involved in the sewer business uh, until about that time, and then it could only be involved in the creation of a sewer system if it was serving areas of more than two municipalities. So in 1975, the county sewer agency is uh, created, and immediately the North Chautauqua Lake Sewer District, the Center Chautauqua Lake Sewer District, and the South Chautauqua Lake Sewer District are created. And we go into engineering studies, <clears throat> and we get estimates that are going to cost us millions upon millions of dollars. Uh, at that particular time, the federal and state aid was uh, uh, down around about 50%. And when we got the numbers, uh, 
they were, they were very, very high. Uh, and the financing costs were, were very expensive. However, the impetus of the Gunkler study that had been done in the 60s was still there. Uh, the health department had closed a number of our beaches a number of different times uh, because of coliform count. Uh, sewer plants were overflowing at surcharge during spring freshets and, and storms. And we began to move on those. There's a whole history to be found uh, on that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. There were a series of accusations. There was some misengineering. Uh, some people forgot to remember the geological history of the lake. We forgot that stone wasn't immediately available. Where we thought stone was at 65 feet, it was at 165 feet and we went through organic silts. In some instances, sewer lines could not be constructed as gravity flow systems. And so we, when we look at the center in the north in the South Chautauqua Lake Sewer District, we see a very uh, selection of technologies used, including uh, force mains, including pump grinders, uh, extensive lines. Interestingly enough, and something that I'm very proud of, was that at the time Bill Parment was working with me, and we did a schematic study of the sewers that were needed in the center in the South Chautauqua Lake Sewer District. And when the final funding came through for those districts, only 2,000 feet of the line that Bill and I suggested were needed were not qualified for federal grant programs, which uh, to me was, was just an excellent piece of work, basically on Bill's part at, at that time. Uh, one of the things that happened is that we look forward to spending tens of millions of dollars in these sewer systems. And how did we finance them? Well, fortunately, at that particular time, and up until they were all online in about 1982, we received grants ranging, depending upon an element of the system or the whole system, anywhere from 66.5% to 87.5% in state and federal grants. So this allowed the cost of sewers basically to stay under $400 a year for the, the people in these districts. Uh, at one point, the Center Chautauqua Lake Sewer District was going to have its own sewage plant. I happened to be on the sewer board at that time, and I asked the engineering firm to estimate what it would cost for us to join the South Chautauqua Lake Sewer District, and how much more would it be for the people in the Center Chautauqua Lake Sewer District a year. The cost came up somewhere between five and six dollars a year. I therefore moved with Dick Evans as chairman of the uh, Center Chautauqua Lake Sewer District that we not build a Center Chautauqua Lake Sewer District plant, but rather go to the South Chautauqua Lake Sewer District. And that's the way it happened. And uh, that's about what the cost differential was. And for the Center Chautauqua Lake Sewer District, for parts of it, we got 3% financing for uh, a number of years. As we go through the 80s, uh, we find more and more development taking place on the lake. Uh, interestingly enough, something that you don't think would affect the lake happens, and that's the Agricultural Act. The National Agricultural Act, I don't know its exact title, of 1985, which had a dairy buyout in it, and dynamically reduced the number of cattle in the Chautauqua Lake watershed. We then almost lost the muskellunge in Chautauqua Lake in the 1980s. Realized that the walleye pike, of course, came in in the early 60s. Why the population uh, shrank, uh, we don't absolutely know. We know that, however, this, that the female muskellunge at 32 inches possibly had not spawned yet, or maybe only spawned once, and we were allowed to keep her. And so the state of New York said, hey, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the female muskellunge has an opportunity to spawn several times before she's taken out of the lake. So now they tell us that the smallest fish we can take is 40 inches long. Have you ever tried to disconnect from a 38-inch muskellunge and not harm yourself or the fish? Uh, welcome to a very rare experience. Uh, during this, the early 70s, the Chautauqua County Legislature, under the leadership of Joseph Jirasi as county executive, begins the Chautauqua Lake Benchmark Studies, which is a series of studies to update uh, the Allegheny River Basin Report of uh, the 1937. 
And we have a team of people from the State College at Fredonia and from the um, Jamestown Community College uh, doing extensive studies to update this report and to give us a new understanding of Chautauqua Lake as it exists uh, at, uh, in the 70s. We're having terrible, terrible algae blooms on the lake, fearsome algae blooms. Uh, people are repulsed from the lake in June because of the algae blooms. 1975, the Chautauqua Malted Milk Plant shuts down. 1976, the weed community at the north end of the lake goes through a dynamic change, and the, the uh, monofilament, uh, not monofilament, uh, Mariophyllum uh, almost disappears uh, as opposed to being acres and acres of surface floating weeds uh, in the previous years. We then, uh, the Lake Association is, is still deeply involved in using chemicals on the lake. Uh, there is an upset time about the use of chemicals. Uh, whether or not it had anything to do with the loss of the muscalunch, who knows. And uh, finally one day, under a new administration, John Glenzer calls me up and he says, John, I want you to come meet with Larry Nelson and, and John Spagnoli of DEC. Got a little job for you. And they handed to me at lunch at uh, Bemis Point, uh, the Italian fisherman, the challenge of a creating an aquatic vegetative management plan as an amendment to the aquatic vegetation control program uh, of the state of New York. Uh, we bring in uh, the refugates, uh, Mark and Kelly, they become part of the staff to work on that. Kelly is still in the county planning department. We go through two years with a moratorium on the use of any chemicals on the lake. We go through a series of public meetings with a citizen's advisory body and with a technical advisory panel, and we come up with a proposal uh, for influencing the aquatic vegetation in the lake. Uh, people are not happy with the report. Uh, an organization called Save Our Lake Environment is, exist, uh, is brought into existence by people that are opposed to the use of any chemicals on the lake, and they play an interesting role in, in the final shaping of the plan and its implementation. The, uh, Plan is completed in 1990. It goes through its environmental impact statement hearings. Uh, it's adopted, and it becomes the guiding tool for the Chautauqua Lake Association uh, and its use of aquatic vegetation uh, control chemicals. 1992, 1994—there uh, is, is another study instituted on the lake uh, concerning the nutrient budget. And possibly at a later date, I'll be able to bring Kelly Refrajack and Mike Wilson from the State College at Fredonia up, and we can talk about where the nutrient loading from Chautauqua Lake into the lake, where is it coming from? I'll give you this clue. It's the spring freshet and the general storms of the watershed. It's not from the, while the sewage treatment plants are now secondary plants, where 85% of the solids are settled out, there's still chemistry going into the lake. But the, the watershed is the major contributor, and whether or not we were to do, go to advanced uh, technology in our sewage treatment plants, we would change the quality of the water any further or not is open to question, and we'll find out about it uh, by 1966. And maybe we can come back and do a, a whole session on our new understanding of the lake. That program is being done with a large citizen advisory uh, committee and the Lake Association and the Chautauqua Lake Conservancy uh, are involved with it as well as the Chautauqua Lake Association. It's our lake, it's up to you and I to decide how and when and when we will be happy with the quality of the water in the lake and our use of it. It's yours and my responsibility. I invite you to join us in the years to come uh, as we struggle with being respectful of the lake. And the next session we'll talk about the future of Chautauqua Lake.